Hello and welcome to Children with Diabetes Screenside Chat. We are going to be talking today with Dr. Laura Smith. My name is Marissa and I am the Clinical Director for Children with Diabetes. And we're just going to give a couple minutes for people to trickle in so that we can get started. Hi everybody, looking forward to chatting. Yeah, and please feel free to send in questions via the Q&A feature or the chat feature anytime throughout the webinar is fine. And I think I will go ahead and get started on introducing Laura. So I've actually known Laura, I think 10 years? No, yeah. That's least. probably right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, time flies. <laughs> um, Laura and I used to work together in Tampa, and until recently, Laura was still in ta the Tampa Bay area, and recently has migrated up to Ohio, which happens to be where I just migrated back to, <laughs> and she is working at Cincinnati Children's as a clinical diabetes psychologist. And Laura does have a lot of expertise and personal experience in this area. And I don't know if you want to say anything else about yourself. Sure. Well, the other probably important thing to talk about is that I also have had type 1 diabetes for um, 20 years this year. Yep, this Ooh. is my 20th year. Yeah, so it was. Are you planning on doing any, anything? <laughs> well, so it, it passed back in February. And so I didn't do anything super duper cool, sadly. Um, but I did, I usually do something like have, you know, a cupcake or, you know, something like that to celebrate. And of course take insulin, um, <laughs> but just as a way of saying like, hey, I made it this long. I've been managing diabetes and it's hard sometimes, but here I am. Yep. Exactly. <laughs> All right, All right, well, well I will, to... yes, go ahead. If you want to pull up your slides, I'll go ahead and uh, hide my video and I'll be monitoring the chat and the Q&A. So again, if anybody has questions, please feel free to type them in. All right, so let me make sure I can get this to work okay, guys. Are you, I'm moving over to my slideshow. Are you able to see my slideshow now, Marissa? Everything's looking yes. okay? Looks okay. Like Great. Well, so I really just prepared a few slides today. I was much more interested in you guys having time to ask questions or kind of talk more or less rather formally about things. But I thought that since the title of our, my talk today or the, this webinar is Kids Mental Health, I wanted to talk a little bit just in the beginning about what types of um, symptoms or challenges you might be noticing with your child or your teen if they are in fact struggling with um, a mental health related concern. Um, so many of you have probably seen lists like this before, but I just wanted to highlight a few on this list. Um, and because I wasn't certain about how many of those of you who are joining us today would be parents of younger children versus parents of adolescents versus maybe even parents of young adults, um, these sort of cross um, the age span. They can kind of be applicable for all ages. So certainly if you notice any sadness or worry or fear in your child, there's there certainly symptoms that suggest that they may be struggling with mental health issues. Um, this third bullet point that I have on my slide here, irritability or anger, is one that is often overlooked or sort of not fully recognized as a mental health related symptom. And it's actually irritability, in fact, is one of the most common symptoms of depression, particularly in children and adolescents and in um, boys in particular. So I just wanted to highlight that because sometimes um, families will not fully sort of be um, recognizing that as a symptom of potential depression. So just be on the lookout for that. Um, problems concentrating and learning or focusing, certainly that can be related to things like ADHD, but we also see that as a common challenge for kids who are struggling with um, mental health concerns like depression and anxiety. 
mood changes, um, avoiding family, friends, or other social activities. So a really common thing that parents will report to me when they come to see me for mental health concerns is that their child's behavior has changed from where it was before. So they, in the past, might have been very active socially or very interested in engaging with their family or with friends, and now they're no longer doing that. They're staying in their room more, they're withdrawing, um, they don't seem that interested in um, interacting with others. So that too is a symptom at times of mental health struggles. Um, anytime we notice changes in sleeping habits or eating habits, that could be a sign of mental health issues. Um, certainly for older, um, for teens and young adults, um, overuse of substances could be a problem. Um, if a child has lots of physical ailments and there hasn't been um, an obvious cause identified. So things that we typically see in this area are kids who have frequent stomach aches, frequent headaches, things like that. Now certainly sometimes there may be an underlying cause that's identified, but kids who have anxiety or depression sometimes have these types of symptoms. It's sort of a physical manifestation of those mental health challenges that they're having. So being on the lookout for that. Um, certainly thoughts of suicide is clearly a, um, a sign of a mental health struggle. Trouble being able to sort of carry out daily activities. You know, I like to call this just being overwhelmed with life. Um, so if your child or your teen is really having a hard time um, getting things done for school and seems overwhelmed by even relatively manageable things, that might be another sign that they're really having some mental health struggles. And then particularly as we move from childhood into adolescence and young adulthood, we often see um, issues around body image. So if you notice that your, um, your teen or your young adult is um, displaying an intense fear or worry about weight gain or a strong um, concern about their appearance, that could be another sign that they're struggling with mental health issues. Oops. All right. So um, a lot of times when I talk about mental health issues in the type 1 diabetes population, people are really curious about how common these concerns are. And the truth is that they, they're quite common. So um, there are lots of ways to look at this. And so if we look in the research literature, there are wide varieties of wide um, sort of rates of mental health disorders that are published when I've done studies that look at this. Um, so in general, the, the statistic that I tend to quote most often is that mental health issues are three times more common in kids and teens with type 1 diabetes. So quite a bit more common than what we see in kids who don't have any chronic conditions like type 1. Um, another study that is actually a quite an, an older study at this point, but it does a really nice job of tracking children after they were diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. They actually tracked kids for about 10 years after diagnosis, and they found that at some point within that 10 years, almost half of those kids experienced a mental health issue. So that didn't mean that those mental health issues were always ongoing throughout the whole 10 years, but at some point, almost half had had some trouble with a mental health issue like depression or anxiety or a behavioral issue. So really common diagnoses that we see um, in the general population but also in kids with type 1 diabetes are depression, anxiety, behavior problems, and ADHD. And you guys will see here on my slides that I give you some sort of estimates of the prevalence of these problems in the T1D population, at least for some of these. Um, we don't have great numbers for all of these. Um, and I just want to put the caution out there that these are sort of um, our estimates based on um, reviews of the literature. And there's typically a range, right? So um, approximately 17% of kids with type 1 at some point might struggle with depression and about 18% might struggle with anxiety. Um, and I wanted to highlight really quickly, I won't go into the details of these diagnoses unless um, others have a question about it, but um, some kids who struggle with anxiety have what we call generalized anxiety, and that focuses more on um, having anxiety about, about a variety of different things. Um, these kids could be anxious about school and family and friends. It might just be anxiety about a lot of things. These are kids that we might describe as being worriers. 
Um, and then there are kids that have more specific type of challenge with anxiety, those that might have panic attacks or social anxiety, which um, is sort of very basically fear of or anxiety related to social interactions or being embarrassed in social situations. So those are quite common, especially for teenagers. We see these, these types of anxiety issues present frequently. Um, ADHD is, um, as many of you I'm sure already know, is a condition that's relatively common in childhood. There's not a lot of evidence out there that kids with type 1 have a higher rate of ADHD than the general population, but I put it on my slide here because certainly if your child is struggling with ADHD, that often um, makes it even more challenging to manage diabetes on a daily basis. And then behavior problems, things like oppositional defiant um, behaviors or other more serious behavior problems are, um, are present in kids with type 1. Um, there's sort of mixed findings out there in the literature about whether these are more common in kids with type 1. But again, certainly for those kids who have type 1 and one of these behavior problems, um, we see them struggle more in terms of managing and coping with their type 1. Um, and last but not least on my slide, I just wanted to mention um, a, a phenomenon that is unfortunately quite common and that you as parents, especially if you're a parent of a adolescent, um, so a you know, preteen or a teenager, you may have heard of this um, and may be concerned about it. So it's a behavior that we call self-harm. Um, oftentimes in um, sort of the, the everyday world, people refer to this as cutting. Um, although cutting um, oneself is not the only form of self-harm, but self-harm is a behavior that we um, actually have seen increase somewhat in the past um, you know, five to 10 years or so. And there are some pretty high estimates of how many kiddos out there are actually engaging in these behaviors. So depending on sort of how you look at this, and it's been looked at in lots of different ways, um, somewhere between 17 to maybe as high as 22 percent of, um, of kids and teens might have this problem at some point in their life um, or at some point over the course of the prior year in the case of that 17% estimate. Um, and so parents often who, um, who I work with or parents out in the community who might um, have come to realize that their child is self-harming or engaging in those types of behaviors, like again, cutting is sort of the most common form of this, um, are often very worried and understandably very frightened. Um, typically, self-harm is not thought of as a gesture that is intended to kill oneself, but it's more about, um, it's a gesture that kids and teens often use when they don't have great coping strategies. And so it's something they do to sort of manage really strong behaviors. Um, obviously, it's a not a, um, an adaptive or an, a great way of managing um, really strong emotions. And so when I work with kids who have this, a lot of times what we're talking through is what can they do um, to cope with those strong feelings that doesn't involve self-harm. So we kind of help them come up with additional, more adaptive coping strategies for that. But again, I wanted to mention that as a, a, um, a common mental health issue because um, many of you may have heard of that or had experience with that. Okay, so quickly I wanted to talk a little bit about sort of diabetes specific mental health issues. Um, and many of you have likely heard of some of these before, especially if you've been active in the um, CWD community. Um, so all of the things that I spoke about on the prior slide were really more general mental health concerns that certainly can impact um, kids with type one, but can impact the general population as well. Um, the, the types of challenges I have listed on this slide are the things that are very um, specific to kids and adolescents and young adults with type 1 diabetes. So I'm sure um, at some point you guys have probably heard of the idea of diabetes distress and burnout. Um, and we think about diabetes distress as being distinct from general depression. And it is more of, um, it's a, a a set of symptoms or behaviors or thoughts and feelings that are more specific to diabetes. So it has some similarities with depression, but it is distinct. Um, and some of the hallmarks of someone who has diabetes distress or diabetes burnout, as it's often referred to, is that they're very tired of diabetes tasks, they're overwhelmed with taking care of diabetes, and oftentimes they're expressing sort of very hopeless 
negative things about managing their diabetes. Things like, you know, no matter what I do, diabetes just doesn't seem to work out or, um, you know, I'm never going to get my A1C where I want it to be. Those types of statements or those types of thoughts are, are indicative or sort of hallmarks of diabetes distress. And this is quite common in people with type 1. And in fact, Usually what we say is that at some point in the course of having type 1 diabetes, everyone will experience some amount of diabetes distress or burnout. For some, it's more significant than others, but everyone has days where they sort of feel burned out of taking care of diabetes because it's a lot. Um, fear of hypoglycemia is another challenge that is very specific to type 1 diabetes or possibly type 2 diabetes, but um, this is really common. And I actually think this is... Um, under-diagnosed or under-recognized in the type 1 population. Um, I think that there are many times that um, kids, adolescents, and even adults with type 1 um, have higher blood sugar numbers, and, um, and the sort of their diabetes providers miss the fact that they may have those higher blood sugar numbers because they're concerned, worried, or fearful of going low. Um, so signs that your, um, your child or your teen might be struggling with fear of hypoglycemia include things like if you notice that they're avoiding giving a full correction when they have a high blood sugar or when they're eating, if they're avoiding giving a full dose for the carbs that they're taking in. And so this doesn't mean that they miscount the carbs. This is um, if they are counting carbs or they actually know what their blood sugar number is and they're choosing to give a full correction or a full bolus because they're concerned about going low. Um, other things that sometimes people do that suggest a fear of hypoglycemia is driving some of their diabetes behaviors. If they're treating blood sugars when they're not low, so say their blood sugar gets to 90 or 100, and they're already um, you know, taking 15 grams of carbohydrates, um, that could be a sign that they have fear of hypoglycemia. And then if you notice just across the board that they've been trying to sort of keep their blood sugars at a higher level than what's recommended, that's another sign. Um, kids who struggle with fear of hypos often avoid, in more significant cases of this, they might start avoiding activities where lows are common. So if they often go low when they're at PE, they may be coming up with reasons that they can't go to PE or wanting to sit out of PE. Um, so that's something that we see sometimes. And again, sort of the hallmark or the underlying piece here is that the person is very fearful of lows or of low blood sugar symptoms. And then last but not least on my slide, I wanted to just briefly mention that disordered eating um, is also something that people with type 1 diabetes struggle with at times. As many of you already know, people with type 1 have to do a lot of focusing on what they eat and counting the carbohydrates and what they eat, among other things. And so sometimes this can lead to problematic eating behaviors, like very rigid patterns of eating, um, a really intense focus on food. Um, you may notice that your teen is avoiding certain types of foods. And when I, when I say avoiding foods, I don't mean that they have chosen to be a vegetarian or they're you know, trying to eat more healthy or making choices like that. I mean, they might say, hey, I'm not gonna eat any desserts ever, or just being very restrictive in their eating. Um, those are all signs that they may be struggling with disordered eating. And then in sort of the most significant or severe form of disordered eating, people with type 1 do on occasion emit insulin in order to reduce the chance that they're going to gain weight or in order to avoid weight gain. And so that becomes certainly very problematic, not only because it suggests sort of an underlying dis pattern of disordered eating, but also because it can certainly be very um, detrimental to diabetes management. Okay. So I'm certainly happy to answer more questions about this, but I thought I would put up a slide to kind of help guide you or think about things that you could do or places that you could seek help if your child is in fact um, struggling with one of the things that I've already talked about today. Um, so <clears throat> I often recommend that families start with asking their endocrinologist or their pediatrician for a mental health referral if you are worried or concerned that your child might be struggling with one of the things that I spoke about today. Um, most endos and pediatricians are quite well connected in the community and they often have um, a number of uh, counselors or psychologists or other folks that they can refer to and that they've referred other children to and have 
um, sort of feedback on how they have had that, um, if they've had a good experience with those folks. So it's actually a really great place to start. And certainly your endocrinologist is a great place to start if, um, if you are, um, if you feel like some of the challenges that your child is struggling with are diabetes related, because endocrinologists very often have connections in the community for folks who have worked before with kids with type one. So they might know more than the average therapist about type one, and that can be really helpful in therapy. Um, the American Diabetes Association actually has done a really nice job in the past few years at putting out a mental health directory. And I put the link here for that directory. Um, and so this is, move myself around here. I don't know if you guys see where that is on my screen. Um, so this directory is one where professionals, so they can be psychologists or other mental health care providers, are listed on this site only if they've been able to sort of show that they have experience working with people with diabetes or if they've taken um, professional education credits in the area of diabetes. So um, it's a really nice website, and I hope they're getting more and more people who are joining that website all the time. Um, and you can kind of search by area. So you can search for a provider within your area and see if there are any folks on the, on the website that have dealt with diabetes in their practice and have experience. Um, your child's school counselor is another great place to find um, resources. So some schools have um, groups for kids with certain challenges. So if your child is struggling with anxiety, your school may have a group for kids with anxiety. Some school counselors are able to do counseling within school, um, which can be really helpful, or they may have connections with other community-based agencies that come into the, your child's school and could do counseling there. Um, so that can be another good resource. Um, you can contact your insurance company to find someone. Um, because of the COVID pandemic, um, many, if not most, insurances are actually covering telehealth now, which has been really nice. And so that sometimes opens up new possibilities for, um, for mental health providers that you can work with that might not be you know, within a 10 or 15 minute drive of your house. So that's been um, one of the positive things that's come out of the COVID pandemic. Um, asking friends or family, other people around you may have had experiences with counselors before and they may be able to recommend a good one for you. And then the two um, last bullet points on this slide are more national resources. And so the National Alliance on Mental Health, or Mental Illness rather, um, they have a hotline um, or um, an email address that you can send to and they can send you a list of mental health providers in your area. Those will not be diabetes specific mental health providers, but um, it still can be a good place to start depending on what your child's struggling with. And then the College Diabetes Network also has a mental health um, resource hub that can be really useful as well. Okay, so real quick, I think this is one of my last slides before I take questions. Um, I, I also think that when you're seeking mental health care, there can be confusion about sort of what to ask for or what certain providers can, um, can offer. And so I wanted to just put a little blurb up about that part. Um, so if you are interested in pursuing medication for your child or your teen or your young adult to help with mood or mental health issues, then you would need to look for um, providers like psychiatrists, perhaps even your pediatrician. Many pediatricians can be a first line um, or can prescribe a first line antidepressant or first line medication for anxiety management. So they can be a good resource for that. And then nurse practitioners in the area of psychiatry can also prescribe medication. Um, for therapy or counseling, generally um, you should be looking for folks like psychologists like myself, social workers, therapists, and mental health counselors. Now, some of the labels or the, um, the names of these different professions can vary a bit by state, but those are some of the most common names. Um, so I just wanted to mention that because sometimes people get confused about the different folks and what they can and can't do. Okay, so I think that brings me to kind of the conclusion of the things that I wanted to talk about right off the bat. I have some other slides that I might refer to depending on what kind of questions you guys have. Let me I'll stop sharing my screen, right, Marissa? Yes, that sounds great. Thank there you so go. much, Laura. For sure. Really, really helpful and informative. And for those of you that are live on this webinar, I did type in the resources that Laura referred to into the chat box. So you can just click on it or copy and paste it into a browser. 
Um, and we did have one question come in. And if anyone else has questions, please feel free. And you can also submit it anonymously if you don't want to have your name attached to it. No worries. Um, so the question that we had submitted is for older kids and teens who are struggling with burnout. Do you recommend that parents offer to take di over diabetes care tasks, such as you know BG monitoring or you know drawing up cartridges for insulin pumps, et cetera, or um, to give the kids a break from those diabetes self care tasks? Yeah, it's a really good question. And the short answer is yes, that's absolutely, that's actually a great thing to do when um, actually a child of any age expresses diabetes burnout is to talk with them about how truly diabetes is hard and see an offer to help with certain tasks. And so some of the tasks that, that the question, um, the person who put for the question put out there were great ones. So things like filling cartridges, um, you know, crowning carbs for meals so that they can have a little break in doing that. It's, it's truly different for every child and teen. So I think one of the most important things you can do is just to talk to them about that and say, ask, and to ask, basically, what can I do to help? Um, but yeah, that's, a, that's really our, our go-to suggestion for diabetes burnout is, at least in terms of what parents can do, is really offer to jump in and help. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I'll just, one more thing I'll say about that is that sometimes parents are concerned that then, um, so many parents that I talk to are very wisely interested in their, their kids and their teens in particular becoming more independent in their diabetes care management. And so sometimes they have worries that, you know, well, if I jump in and I start doing things for them, is that not helping them develop that independence? Um, and again, short answer to that, no. Um, it actually can, over time, sort of promote them being more open to taking on those tasks or taking them back if you're taking them over from them. Um, so yeah, so this is something they're gonna have to manage for you know their whole life or at least until we find a good, good cure. And so I think that if they can have a break, um, that doesn't mean they don't know how to do it. It just means you're helping them out and giving them a little break. Yeah, and I think it's about how you frame it with your child too. And like you said, I think we all, you know, I also live with type one diabetes uh, for, 31 years this year. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it really, it's that conversation and just framing it as, hey, you know, I know that this is an everyday thing for you. Let me, let me help you out here so that you can focus on school or your friends or Halloween or whatever, mm -hmm. whatever your kids are thinking about these days. Yep. Um, and we did have another question submitted. So thank you for submitting it. So this question is, uh, what suggestions do you have for young people with T1D, young kids? My four-year-old was re recently diagnosed and is not showing any signs of mental health concerns now, but I'm not sure what it may look like in the future for younger kids. Mm -hmm. So good question. So for younger kids, and I don't know that I really highlighted this on my first slide when I was talking about all the different mental health symptoms, but for young kids, a lot of times what we'll notice is that they have more behavior issues. So if your child um, has previously been a pretty calm, easygoing child, and then you know they over time start to be more reactive to things, having more tantrums, and um, you know saying no more often, or you guys are arguing about tasks. Those are some of the sort of early signs of a mental health issue. So oftentimes for little kids, especially like around the age four or five, they may not be so great at verbalizing their emotions. So those emotions can come out in other ways, like with behavior issues, tantrums, things like that. So that's what we we typically see. Um, there occasionally are really, are really verbal um, four or five, six year olds, and they can tell you that they're feeling sad or worried. Um, but that's that's something definitely to be looking for the more behavioral issues in that age group. Yeah. And as a, so I'm also a parent of young children as I think <laughs> our participants are. So what would you recommend for us as far as how do we um, talk to our younger kids um, about, about those things? So for example, let's say they're throwing tantrums or things like you said, you know, how do you recommend um, sort of teaching them to recognize their emotions? Mm -hmm. So um, that is a really good question. So I, I, what I'll say about that is that in the moment, it's nice to sort of label a potential emotion that you see. So if your child is, you know, seeming as if they're probably mad about something that happened or worried or scared about something that happened, it's good to label the emotion like sounds like or looks like you might be feeling angry or you might be feeling mad. Um, but in the moment, it's also good to give your child a break. So I think it's okay to verbalize about that much. Like, seems like you're feeling mad about 
blah, blah, blah. Um, and maybe you need a break to cool down and then have them do something that's calming for them. A lot, for a lot of kids that can be, you know, going to a place in the house that's more quiet, not necessarily as a punishment, not like a go to your room, you're in trouble, but as a go to your room, it, it, you need to cool down a little bit. And then after they're more cool down, and I can talk a little bit about what you could do to help them cool down um, and what you could suggest to them. But after they're cool down, then it can be more useful to actually talk to them more about what was going on, what might have caused them to feel that way, and sort of tie those things together. Um, I think one of the biggest challenges that parents often get into is trying to sort of talk to them in that moment when their emotions are way up here. And many of us adults included, we don't hear things that well when our emotions are way up here. And so, you know, you're sort of, you know, talking and it's not sinking in. So trying to minimize the amount of talking and redirecting to a sort of a cool down activity. Um, so for really young kids, good cool down activities can be things like, like holding a teddy bear or blowing bubbles, or sometimes if your child has trouble with this a lot, they can make things that help them to cool down, like glitter um, um, jars that they can kind of look at, things that sort of distract them and calm them. Um, you can also direct them to something that they like to do that's sort of quiet, like drawing or coloring or listening to a favorite song or um, within reason, I suppose, watching a favorite TV show or something on a tablet, something like that to kind of distract them and help them to calm down. Great. Yep. I think that's really helpful. Um, and then I wanted to ask a couple of other questions that, um, you know, I think sometimes it's, it's a little difficult to answer these because we're all in such an interesting time in our lives. That, uh, you know, I've seen a few things like I could really go for some precedented times and I'm really feeling that sometimes. Yep. Um, but, you know, with, with everything, with the pandemic and, you know, going back to school and, and things like that, um, some, some families are having kids at home and some families are having kids at school. And, you know, I don't know, I think for me as a person with diabetes and probably for many parents of kids with diabetes, we are a little bit more concerned about our health. And I think that's totally fair and valid. Um, so how do you, how do you recommend talking to your kids where you want to help them understand that you're trying to keep them safe and protected without making them feel different? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yep. So I, I agree with you, Marissa. We're sort of all in that place right now and, you know, just trying to figure it out. So I do think that all, so much of this depends on the age of your kid and also um, sort of how, how interested they are in knowing lots of information. So, you know, a really uh, sort of the, I guess I would start out with saying kind of meet your child where they are in terms of information about COVID and why you're making certain choices and what the risks are. Um, so for a very young child, like a four-year-old, they don't need to know lots of details, right? But they just might need to know that, hey, we're gonna, we don't go over to, you know, your friend's house anymore because um, there are germs out there that could make us sick or because COVID's out there and that could make us feel not very good. Um, so, so meet, the, meet your child where they are in terms of talking about it. Um, I also think that it's good to be truthful, um, but it doesn't mean you have to go into lots and lots of detail about it. Um, so, you know, again, I think it's important to talk about the fact that COVID can be dangerous, but also to reassure that the different things that you guys are doing or any family's doing to make kids feel safe. Um, so a lot of times when I'm working with kids in, treatment who are really nervous about like going back to school or doing new things that they haven't done in a while um, because of COVID. We talk a little bit about them going through sort of a mental list of the things that they're doing to try to make the situation as safe as possible for them, right? Like a safety checklist or something. Um, you can call it whatever you want, but you know, so if you're wearing a mask, that's one thing on your safety checklist. If you're staying a little distant from people, that's another thing. We're not going to give hugs at this point, at least with people outside of our family. So just reminding them of those things, those are the things we can control. And so much about anxiety and worry is about sort of focusing on those things that we have some level of control over. Um, so those are my thoughts. And I guess the only other thought that I have about this for now, and some other stuff might come to me, but um, is just to really be cognizant or aware of how much 
um, especially for older children, how much information they might be getting from the news and things and trying to sort of limit that or at least have that happen in small doses or in doses where you're there and you can sort of provide background information. So I don't know that this is um, for better or for worse, I don't know that this is happening as much anymore, but I know when COVID first happened, like there were sort of daily, you know, updates on how many people have it and how many people might have died from it. And so I think that that was very, can be very time consuming. It can really get to anyone, adults included, right? And so limiting exposure to that sort of thing can be really helpful in terms of managing anxiety and not increasing stress and anxiety levels. Yeah, I really like that that uh, safety checklist idea. <laughs> I honestly think I think that could be really helpful. And maybe this is something you already do recommend for people. You know, you mentioned concern of uh, fear of hypoglycemia that a lot mm-hmm. of people have that. Yep. And um, I don't know, is that something that you use for that? All? It, it is. Yeah. So, I mean, in a way, I have to know that I call it that, but it's, it, we do, when people are worried about hypos, we do have them sort of think about, okay, what are the things, what is the reality of the situation, right? So, um, you know, if I do go low, I have these things I can put into place. I'm wearing my Dexcom and so I'll have warning if I go low. So we have them sort of go through these very um, logical and realistic things that are actually true. So it's similar in that way. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And then how about, so we talked a little bit about sort of the anxiety spectrum with the Q and A so far. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I want to go to the sort of other, another side of mental health, which mm-hmm. would be the, um, the depressed or apathetic teenager or older child. Um, and I think that's so challenging to, to help people like um, when they're just like, you know, just not worried about it or they're feeling too down to even think about worrying about it. So Mm -hmm. what are some tips for, for people who have kids that are just really struggling with that side of things? Mm -hmm. For sure. Well, so I think that certainly if you think that your child is struggling with um, sort of clinically significant symptoms of depression, so it's really impacting multiple areas of their life and they're so apathetic or feeling so down that they're sort of struggling to maintain their typical activities or engage in typical ones, then I think professional help is uh, certainly warranted. Um, Things that I think as a parent you could do in the meantime or in addition are um, really encouraging activity. So oftentimes when I see families in therapy for um, depression or sort of similar concerns, that's one of the first places we start. So there's a sort of a, um, a term which sounds fancy but really isn't behavioral activation, which basically means that when you're feeling depressed, if you get out and do things, it helps you to feel better. Um, so, and truly we talk about that in therapy as a medicine, almost like a medicine for treatment of depression. Um, so as a parent, that can be one place that you can really be helpful is encouraging your child or your teen to get out and do things. Now, the challenge of course, is that they often don't feel like doing that. Right. So, so I don't, I'm not minimizing that challenge, but anything that you can do to sort of help make that happen, even on a small scale. So it doesn't have to be anything um, huge. It doesn't have to be sometimes people think they only say like get out and be active. It means like you have to be running or some like intensive exercise. It doesn't have to be that. It can be as simple as like going out on the porch and sitting for a little while outside. So it's just sort of doing something. Um, And a lot of times with kids and teens, I kind of start by, and parents could do this too, kind of coming up with a list of things that they enjoy or have enjoyed. Maybe they're not enjoying them quite as much anymore, Um, but sort of coming up with a list and making an agreement to try something at least a couple of times a week. Um, That's the other challenge with using something like behavioral activation is oftentimes um, like a teen or a child might say, well, yeah, I did that one day and it didn't help. And the truth is that it takes a little while longer than that, right? So we have to do it sort of consistently for maybe a few weeks before we sort of see a benefit from it. So kind of helping them to push through that could be really useful too. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, someone made a a comment about, you know, something else to consider is to seek out local support groups for family Mm -hmm. uh, camps, even in COVID, they're coming up with yeah, creative avenues to do this, um, just to find people that understand you. And I'd like to piggyback onto what we just said. And I think sort of, um, I think as a parent helping having their peers or their friends with diabetes or like enlisting their close friends as as your allies if you need to could probably be pretty helpful or absolutely things um, things like that 
Yep. Nope. I completely agree. Of course, we're all in this place where it makes it more challenging right now, but anything you can do to make that happen, I think is really, is really helpful. Even if it's not in person, if it's, you know, online, or if you can, you know, find another family or two that you feel like are taking precautions and you can meet with them or play with them outside, you know, with masks. So it's doing things like that can be really helpful. Um, yeah, that's awesome. And there's, uh, there are a lot of good resources um, out there for meeting other families. I highly recommend looking into your local camps um, if you have local JDRF groups as well. Um, and then of course, children with diabetes, we have our screen site chats. We have some moms uh, chats called Moffles. Uh, <laughs> and actually, I think we're going to try to start some for other age groups because two teenagers snuck on and I was like, man, they must be really wanting to talk if they're going to the mom. <laughs> um, and then we have, of course, CWD Friends for Life Winter coming up as well. So lots, uh -huh. of, good, lots of good avenues to, to get in and, and really meet other people who, who get it. It's, a, it's an important part of this. Absolutely. Um, I wanted to ask a couple. Oh, I wanted to ask a question that's related to kids' mental health uh, sort of in general. And you touched on this earlier um, about screens. Um, and in time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, screen time and then, you know, just access to all of the information and news and, you know, especially as kids are getting older and they have their own phones. Um, and, you know, I think even more so parents of kids with diabetes want to give their kids a phone so that they have Dexcom share, which is totally important. Um, but, you know, then that opens up this whole different um, different side of mental health that that we're experiencing. And I don't know if you have any sort of like recommendations for parents about, you know, how to have those conversations with your kids about, you know, not everything online is what it seems, you know, those kind of things. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, so that's a huge issue. It's a huge concern. Um, and I think that just having regular check-ins with your teen, I mean, this is typically something that we see more in teens and adolescents, but Certainly younger kids can have um, issues with finding their way onto places and sites that aren't so great um, and might have negative information or um, inaccurate information. Um, but I think continuing to talk to them about it, being really open about it, checking in with them frequently about it. Um, I also think that doing some level of, um, and as kids get older, this isn't always as possible or even appropriate, but doing some level of monitoring what your kids are doing online, certainly for sort of the preteen group, um, making sure you know what they're doing, that they're on social media accounts. You know, many parents will have a rule that they have to be their friend on the account too, you know, if it's Instagram or something like that. So I think that's okay, um, especially at younger ages to have that rule. Um, sometimes kids can get tricky and <laughs> you're always around it, but at least, you know, try your best. Um, I also think that when it comes to screen and screen time, you know, one of the biggest things that I see um, where that makes a difference, certainly there's a mental health side of that and people sort of having, you know, again, negative experiences or, um, you know, having sort of ongoing negative interactions with peers or other people from school online, and that can be sort of like online bullying, things like that. Um, but I actually see it even more so, um, the screen time getting in the way of good sleep for kids. So, and that's a really like an extra tricky um, issue for kids with type one, because you're right, Marissa, that a lot of times they need their phone on some level in order to have like their Dexcom or their CGM still working for them at night. Um, but as, um, I think that as much as you can sort of trying to limit and, and set a really strong um, and consistent rule about no screen time after a certain hour, it, it is a really good rule to set. So just the number of kids, and I think this has been even worse in COVID, um, the number of kids that are staying up, you know, till it's like one, two, three, four, five, I'm not joking, AM, and like their sleep schedules are just completely twisted um, and backwards, and that really, really impacts mental health, and not only that, but it really impacts blood sugars, too, so like if you, you know, some days are staying up till 5 a.m., and other days are going, it just makes things really erratic and out of whack, so um, yep, anything you can do to kind of keep the, the phone out of the room, you know, some parents will do really savvy things, like have kids use, um, you know, they'll turn off certain parts of the internet or access to certain things at night to try to prevent that. So I think anything you can do to stick to a no screen time after a certain hour is a good thing. Yeah. Yep. Great. That's really helpful. Yeah. 
Um, and I do want to touch on one topic that I don't think we discussed. Um, and one of the things that, you know, we try to focus on at Children with Diabetes is that, you know, diabetes really does affect the whole family. Mm -hmm. And um, sometimes, you know, that this does really impact the siblings. And it, of course, depends on if they're older or younger. But, you know, I just wondered if you could sort of touch on, you know, what issues you tend to, to hear about or what you tend to see. Um, I know, for example, I bought my adult sister a box of juice boxes for Christmas last year. <laughs> um, you know, it's sometimes you've got to make it fun, right? Like, yeah, yeah. You know, Marissa always took all the juice boxes. And I'm like, okay, I'm sorry, but it's not always for fun. <laughs> um, but just, you know, what do you, what recommendations do you have for parents to, you know, make sure that they're taking the sibling's perspective into consideration? Sure, sure. Yeah, I mean, a really common thing that we hear is that siblings, and you were sort of implying this, um, Marissa, is that siblings sometimes feel like a lot of the family's time and energy is devoted to the child with type 1, because legitimately it takes, you know, more work and effort and, you no know, parent interaction and participation um, to manage uh, diabetes stuff with uh, the child with diabetes. And so siblings can sometimes feel left out or feel like they're not getting as much attention or parent time. Um, so I think a couple of things that you could, um, that parents can do to help that go better. One is setting up um, individual time with your kids. Um, so the sibling without diabetes, making sure they have, you know, a special day or afternoon where they get to hang out with a parent and on their own so that they feel like they've got their own devoted time. And you can do that. Um, you know, it can be really hard depending on how many kids you have and how many other caregivers you've got in the house. Um, but even doing that, you know, once a month or something so that the, the child without diabetes also feels special. Um, I know a lot of parents have some success with um, figuring out a way that the sibling can be involved in a positive, hopefully not in a nagging, you know, parenting, I'm your big brother and I'm going to, you know, be annoying and tell you what to do sort of way. But if the child without diabetes can be involved in diabetes care tasks, sometimes that can help them feel less left out, right? So if they can go and help by getting the juice box or something like that. That tends to help a little bit more with younger kids who feel left out versus older ones. Um, Cause sometimes the challenges with older kids without diabetes, they might be a little too involved, right? With like parenting and reminding and nagging the child with type one. Um, and then, you know, I also think that doing things like the kind of as overall as being as consistent as possible um, with things like, access to different food and items is good too. So, so I think this happens on both sides of it. So oftentimes kids with diabetes will feel like their siblings get things that they're not allowed to get. And we're, you know, very big fans of, you know, kids with diabetes can eat everything a child without diabetes can have. Um, and I think you can try your best to do the flip side too, where, you know, kids with diabetes might sometimes need, you know, juice socks or glucose tabs or something like that. But then trying to find ways that you're, child without diabetes can sort of be included in that within reason. Not that they get a juice box every time, but you know, are there little like things you can do to let them pick out their special treat at the store so that they have something too, or you know, things like that. Perfect. Yeah. And then um, I wanted to ask one last question, if you don't mind. Sure, if of course. If anybody else has questions, feel free to add them in. I'm trying to sort of cover a spectrum here. Um, so you mentioned disordered eating, and um, you know this is honestly something that's uh, near and dear to my heart. I have a good friend who really struggled with um, disordered eating and body dysmorphia with diabetes, and um, she now mentors other people, which is amazing um, because I think this is something that's just really challenging, and there is such a, a specialty, and not many people honestly even know how to take care of it. Um, and I just wanted to sort of ask, like, um, what, what things should parents be looking out for to recognize those things? And, and again, I mean, this also goes along with the increase in social media. I think we're seeing a lot of, you know, body dysmorphia with kids, diabetes or not. Um, yep. But like you mentioned, we are paying attention to our food all the time and, um, it just makes it a little bit more, um, I don't know, like a, like an easier jump, I think. Mm -hmm. I, I agree completely. 
Yeah, so good things to be looking out for. And by the way, I also think that we oftentimes miss some um, disordered eating behaviors, especially like omitting insulin for weight loss in adolescents. Um, and a lot of times we um, attribute it more to, you know, oh, they're, you know, just not being adherent or they're just not taking care of themselves when in fact, I think sometimes those things are, you know, purposely omitted in order to avoid weight gain or avoid them reduce weight. So things to look for would be things like um, very high blood sugar number. So if your teen um, in particular is, seems to be, you know, missing a lot of injections, um, that is definitely one potential sign. Um, they may be engaging in, in insulin emission. Um, I think that if they're talking a lot about um, negatively, a lot about their appearance, that's another thing to, to look for. If they're weighing themselves quite often, if they're very focused on how much they weigh or losing weight, those are things that um, sort of are a little flag to indicate they might be struggling with that body image piece. Um, yeah, those are the big ones. Yeah. And then I know you, you mentioned, um, well, I put in the chat, there's this, we are diabetes.org, which is a group for, for disordered eating. And mm -hmm. Um, there's also a, there's, if the case is really severe, I know, you know, sometimes, I mean, I've had patients, um, who have needed to go like in the hospital or into an inpatient program. And, and though there's one that I know of for disordered eating, which is Cumberland hospital, but I don't know if, if there are others, I think it's, uh, you know, like I said, it's a very specific problem um, because, you know, diabetes and, um, you know, emitting insulin or diabolemia or things like that. It's just not, it's not as commonly understood. I mean, disordered eating in itself is not as easily understood either. So okay. I don't know, um, like what sort of, how would you know that you needed, that it was so severe that you needed to to seek inpatient services. Mm -hmm. So, and by the way, so Cumberland is the hospital that I know of too. So I don't know that there's a lot of others. There are many others out there. Um, so I think that um, certainly if you suspect disordered eating um, at any level, I think professional health is, is necessary. So um, when we think more about like inpatient treatment, which is what um, Marissa was talking about with Cumberland Hospital. So that typically happens when patients are um, sort of in a place where the, the behavior becomes dangerous to their health. And certainly at all levels, it can be somewhat dangerous to their health, but if their weight is so low that it's a problem, um, like if their BMI goes below a certain place, um, then that's when inpatient treatment is often needed. With teens and young adults with type one, um, that's also sometimes considered if they're um, have had if they've had multiple DKAs or if it's really their A1C is extremely high. So it's having you know their weight may not be the the sort of the dangerous factor. It may be more of a danger because of their poor diabetes management related to it. Well. But, yeah, but you're absolutely right. So disordered eating is sort of an area that we don't have a lot of, um, we don't have enough diabetes psychologists out there. And then psychologists that focus on disordered eating and diabetes are a few and far between. In general, I would recommend for folks to um, seek out um, eating disorder specialists at like pediatric hospitals if, they're, if there's one in their area, because the, they would tend to have sort of the resources or possibly more of a background in sort of the intersection between health and mental health issues. So they, they may have a little more um, comfort level with working with kiddos with type one. Awesome. Mm -hmm. And then I think, you know, I want to end on a positive note. Just oh, okay. <laughs> I don't know. Um, it's a good habit. Yeah. So I, so I think in general, you know, we talk a lot about, um, you know, as healthcare professionals, because um, with working with people with diabetes, about how, um, you know, we do have the kids have higher risks of getting things like diabetes burnout, but that they also seem to have, you know, this resilience and mm -hmm. this ability to just keep doing diabetes every day, even when it gives you ridiculous answers, like you do the same <laughs> thing one day and the next day and you have different results. Um, and I, you know, I think, you know, you and I are both lucky in that most days we feel pretty resilient. Um, so I don't know if there's um, any recommendations you have for parents of, of kids with diabetes on, on how to foster that resilience so that they can keep 
fighting the good fight every day? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. And it is, it's so very important. And, you know, I think that being um, involved in organizations like CWED, where you get to see lots of great examples of, you know, kids and adults who have type one and who have successfully navigated that. No, it doesn't always mean that we, you know, have a great day every single day and everything always goes the way we want it to go. Yeah, right now it doesn't. Um, but I do think that that is really helpful. And I think that's one of the great things that, um, among many, that CWD does is sort of let you have um, interactions and let you see folks who have been able to succeed despite diabetes, right? Um, so, so besides being involved with organizations like that or JDRF or other um, really popular diabetes camps, things like that, um, I think that making sure, and this is, gosh, this is so hard, but making sure as a parent of a kid or a teen with type 1 that you um, aren't always just talking about the times that diabetes goes badly. Right, so it can be really easy to get into this pattern where you're only focusing on the time that blood sugars are high and what happened and what did you do and why didn't it go so well, but really focusing on the times that it does go well too, right? And so fostering that. Um, so I talk a lot to families about the idea that um, learning to do problem solving is really important when you have type one. And so I think the more you can talk to your kids and, and demonstrate problem solving around diabetes tasks with them, the more you can start fostering that resilience. And, um, and you know, the word resilience, I mean, really what we're referring to is having a challenge, but being able to get through it, right? And so that's what problem solving is sort of about. Like there's a problem we have, like my blood sugars are always low or high at this certain time. And so problem Problem solving is a great way to sort of build that resilience. So not sort of being defeated by a problem, but saying, hey, there is a problem. Let's figure out ways we can uh, make it go a little bit better. So that's a good thing. Yeah, those types of things I think are really helpful. Yeah, yeah, I love it. And I think there's a lot of really good creative ways to celebrate things. You know, uh -huh. a lot of people that do, they call uh, 100 a unicorn. And oh, um, I haven't heard that. What is that? You'll have to I tell know. me. I know. Like, uh -huh. like, perfect number even oh yes yes not. okay I mean, everyone has like i think people have different favorite numbers like i feel like mine is like 85 i don't know why. <laughs> like, no why it's my favorite number um and i don't see it i like who knows when i see that anyway um i think finding creative ways with for you as a family um you know we talked at the beginning in case you missed it that you know laura this year is her 20th uh diversary anniversary yeah um you know i just had my 31st and i i was like really focused on my 30th and trying to do something really big for it and then i realized what would a 30 year old like do probably nothing so <laughs> i mean i had a milkshake but, but <laughs> creative things. And sometimes people do like you get a dollar if you, if you get a perfect 100 um, uh, <laughs> a mom who has an, a now adult child and still sends them a dollar when they get That's that. That's too funny. Yeah. Oh my goodness. <laughs> and my parents, I mean, I remember when I was 76, my mom would sing the music man, 76 trombones in the big parade. So I feel like <laughs> myself, all of those things. Um, but yeah, yeah, I think it's really important to celebrate, celebrate yep. the days because uh, they're 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 unicorns they're rare and but they do yeah. happen and it's it's you know if you wear a cgm you see that graph of the ups and downs and that's that's just life with diabetes mm -hmm. so i think having compassion for yourself as a parent of a child with diabetes and yeah. for your child with diabetes um i think that's a really important piece and just remembering that you know we're all in this together and we're trying Hopefully, yep. most of us are trying. I don't yep. know. Yep. <laughs> We're not just trying in their own way. Yep, yes, yep. Exactly. <laughs> well, and Marissa, that's a whole nother topic that I didn't talk about at all, but is a really important one. I'm sure you guys will do a screen side chat about this at some point or a webinar, um, which is parent mental health too, right? So I was really yes. focused on child and teen mental health today, but just wanted to acknowledge that having, you know, that parents really struggle with mental health related issues too, especially when you have a child with chronic illness like type one. So um, yeah. I want to minimize or when a pandemic. <laughs> oh, that too. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Well, thank you everybody. And thank you so much, Laura. This was fabulous. I really appreciate all of your insight and your a wealth of knowledge. And um, we, I appreciate all you do for, for people with diabetes. And um, thanks everyone for participating and signing on later when it
is posted. And uh, just a reminder that our next Greenside chat is on October 18th, and it is with a diabetes, certified diabetes care and education specialist, we talked about this earlier, and dietitian Kim Rose, and it's going to be Making Food Make Sense, which is pretty timely because it's a couple weeks before all that Halloween candy. So thank you so much, everybody. Stay healthy and uh, stay mentally healthy as well. Okay, thanks, everyone.